Okay, now I'm on. Good morning, church. We're really excited to worship with you today. And it's just, I want to remind you that anytime you walk in this room, um, it doesn't mean that everything on the outside disappears. It just means that we get to remember that we get to lift it up to God that he's with us. It's a good reminder for us um, that he's with us in all times and all things. So um, I don't know about you guys, but it's been a, it's been a wild, um, a wild season, Um, a lot of loss and a lot of heartache, but also a lot of um, coming together. And I see community coming together. And I think that's the reminder today is that we, we worship this big God who holds all of it and allows us to, to be with him and he holds all of it. So whatever it is that you've experienced um, this week, I just invite you into a time of lifting all of that up to God, that he is faithful, he is true, he is with you in all things, the good, the celebrations, and the really hard stuff. So right now, what we're going to do is just invite, we want to invite his presence here. So I want to invite you guys to stand up, if you can, and join us as we worship our Savior and our God.
kindness you have poured out grace you brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace giver of mercy you're my help in time of need lord i can help but sing sing faith I sometimes like to think when I'm going through hard things, you know, that God's just going to take me out of those hard things. As if his promise is to just take you out. No, his promise is comfort. His promise is that he would be with you. And that is so true. It's so yes. It's so amen. That he would be with you even to the end of the age. So even when you're going through the rough things, even when you're feeling down, when you're feeling lonely, he's there. He's with you to comfort you and to guide you. So let's sing, I will rest. 
And let's just take that in on us this morning. And I will rest in your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness, yes. And I will rest in your promises, my confidence is your faithful, one more time. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. Oh 
Yes, Lord. We lift you high above all else. We thank you for your promise that it is good, that it is true, that we can trust you. And so with everything that's in us, with every breath, we lift everything in our lives back to you. Thank you, Lord, for being our rock and our salvation and the love that we have within us. We lift everything to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Amen. Good morning, church. Morning. Ooh, that felt good, huh? This is such a cool setup, too. So uh, just feels like our living room. Well, it's good to have you with us this morning. My name is Lindsay Dietz, and I'm the director of Women Engaging. And I'm Chuck Butler. I'm the director of Apologetics and the Arts. Awesome. And we want to just say hi to everybody that's here. A warm welcome if you're new with us. And hello to the tent and the chapel. And those of you who are joining us online, we are all one big body together. And so we want to say hello and welcome. If you are new with us, we would love to know that. We want to connect with you and get to know your name. And out on the piazza, we have a bag for you um, just as a special gift as somebody who's new to um, welcome you. So make sure you grab that. Um, we have several events coming up to let you know about. We want to invite you all to this Thursday, our All Church Night of Worship and Prayer, which is in the chapel. This is our second one. So we'd love to see you there. Also, following that, the next Sunday, um, a week from today, we have our young parents, um, young couples, uh, our morning date where we just provide breakfast for you, a morning of refreshment for you and your spouse. And so want to make sure we get, let you guys know that's coming up so that you go to the right place next weekend. And then um, two weeks from today is our special celebration with Mark and Jan. And so that is a very significant moment in the life of our church. And we want you all here to celebrate with us. It's at 4 p.m. On, on that Sunday. So please mark your calendars and be here to partake with us. And let me drop a few things about this coming Friday. It's our, I think it's our 53rd fine art exhibit. It opens Friday the 7th. And it, I'm very excited about it because we are having, Did you say 53rd? listen carefully, appetizers. Appetizers. Yes, and live music in the Story Cafe at 5.30 p.m. We kick off the art exhibit. And, and that runs until 7 o'clock. And then at 7 o'clock, right in the chapel across the way, we're going to have an amazing speaker. He packed out the chapel last time he was here with his presentation. It's Jay Warner Wallace, one of the best apologists around. He is a L.A. homicide cold case detective that came to Christ and has written multiple books on how you can actually... And here's the title of his message, and I love this. Does Jesus still matter in a world that rejects the Bible? This is a great, great opportunity for you to bring a skeptic or an unbeliever to an amazing event where you can listen to a lecture and ask any questions you want, no matter what your position is in Christ or out of Christ. So please come 7 o'clock this coming Friday in the chapel for J. Warner Wallace. His latest book is called Person of Interest. And by the way, all these events that we're mentioning this morning and everything else is available on the website or check out our app. It's the best. What a gift. How do we go to it all? <laughs> well, coming up, you'll notice if you're out and about, is Harvest Party. It's going to be here before we know it. So you're going to see lots of beautiful, colorful um, bins out there. And it's your time now. This is the time. There's people the Lord has put in your life, and he's asking you to reach out and invite them to come to something that is at a church on campus. This is such a great event for outreach, um, a chance for people to come together and realize how much fun that we get to have here as believers um, to get to know, just familiar, build some relationships. So um, yeah, think about, pray about who that person is in your life, maybe neighbors in your neighborhood, people at your work place. Um, and obviously we're going to be collecting candy. So we would love to have you bring candy. All the barrels will be here for the next few weeks and we would love to see those fill up. Um, but it really truly is because of all of you and your partnership and your generous giving that we can put together events like this that are such ways to bring um, <clears throat> our community in 
to what's, what God's doing around us. So um, thank you so much for your generosity and for your giving. Um, if this is your home church and you are not yet part of um, the the giving and the generosity here, we want to invite you to pray about getting involved. You know, this is so neat when we take ownership all together. And, um, and so we're going to actually pray right now. We're going to be receiving the morning's tithes and offerings, and we're just going to ask for the Lord's blessing and just pay attention to what he's stirring inside of you. Um, <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are just honored and blessed to belong to you. We thank you for your abundance and how much greater um, your love is uh, the more we dive into it. And we just are, are honored, God. It's just the word in my head, Lord. We're just honored to be yours. And so this morning, um, as we give back to you, Lord, in so many of the ways that you have blessed us, um, we pray, Lord, that you would um, free our hearts, Lord, that uh, as we give, Lord, that uh, we would just feel so excited, Lord, about what you're going to do with all of us collectively together. We thank you for the ways in which you've designed your body, your people, to collectively come together and accomplish your will in unison, in unity. And we just ask for um, growing fruitfulness, Lord, as we abide in you, as we um, bring these things to you individually, Lord, and then corporately together. And so we just ask, Lord, for you to continue to show us um, your plans, your ways, and, uh, and train us, Lord. Train us just to be the best stewards of the gifts that you've given us, Lord. And may what comes in this morning, Lord, in this moment, in this time, specifically, be blessed and multiplied for your kingdom, and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Awesome. Oh, Brian's already here. Awesome. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Are you guys loving the Gospel of Mark? What an exciting book. Okay, a couple quick announcements. Number one, great news and bad news. Bad news is we ran out of books. The good news is we sold all 1,500 books. All of them got out there, which is such great news. There's just this feeling of momentum building as people are finding the book, an easy way to invite people who have not normally been comfortable coming to church, to dive into the study with them. So I'm really excited about the way that God's using it to get us together on the same page. It's a little bit of a concrete reminder. We're doing this together. We're on a road trip together. All right? You got your Doritos. You got your Sour Patch Kids. You got your... Your big soda, your cop, whatever, you, your jerky. I'm a, I'm a turkey jerky guy. And we're in this journey together, and I want to share a story with you guys. Oh, real quick, we, because we ran out, we're going to order some more. Now, we actually have found a box still of some leftovers. So we have some leftover. They're being sold in the cafe. So if you didn't get a book, you know someone who wants to get a book, go right now to the cafe. We have more there, and we're ordering another huge shipment of them to come in ASAP so you can be going to the bookstore and get your copy. There we go. All right, so uh, I want to read a testimony to you guys about ways in which God is working through the series and actually uh, through the use of the book, getting people back into reading the Bible, if you're wondering. Uh, for some people, you have your Bible here every week, but other people just say, yeah, I just don't ever even think about using it. And we're trying to get people back into bringing it with them into church, being focused, not distracted on our devices, but looking at the Word of God right there in front of us. We can highlight and underline. Listen to this story. The study journal for the book of Mark has allowed me to slow down when reading the Word of God. I realized I've been rushing at times through the Word and missed important things Jesus wants to say to me. And I want his pace over my life. Going through the journal together in church opens up my mind and soul to really digest it and see it in a new light. I love taking notes and it helps to focus my always busy mind. Now get this. Most importantly, I have been bringing a friend with me to church the past six weeks who's going through a difficult time in their life, which I believed um, has opened up a door for Jesus and they shared that the journal during church has helped them to not feel so lost when reading the Bible. And then she goes on to share how recently her friend dedicated her life to following Jesus here with us 
one of our services and is walking with Jesus. Come on, praise God. Some of the other examples of how God is working through it is just families coming together. Just the other night, day, I was with my son on Saturday, our Sabbath day, and we went up in my room. We opened up to this passage for uh, this coming weekend. We'd read it together, and we were talking about, hey, what do you love about Jesus here? What do you hear God saying to you? And my son and I, my 16-year-old son, are just having a rad moment in the Word of God. So look for those opportunities, ways to get other people into God's Word with you. So uh, with that said, I'm going to read to us our passage for the week. You don't need to stand. This is a a good, solid, long one. Uh, But take notes. I want to encourage you, highlight, underline things as you're listening to it read, things that stand out to you, things that raise questions for you. Let's read together the Word of God. Here we go. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake, and the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell in rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear again or bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others like seed sown among thorns hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, And the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, and some 100 times what was sown. They said to him, or he said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? Duh, for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed. That was my addition, by the way. And whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And he said, or he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground night and day. Whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. And all by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. And as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickles to it because the harvest has come. And again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parables shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. This is the word of the Lord. Let's receive and just give a round of applause for Mark Freestat, who's bringing the word to us today. Come on, Freestat. <laughs> Morning, everybody. All right. Get my 
good set there? All right. Sometimes when you're assigned a passage to preach, uh, you look at the passage and you go, this is so easy, it almost explains itself. Um, there's a passage in James chapter 3 where it talks about taming the tongue, and it gives you examples of the tongue. It's like a forest fire, and it's a restless evil, and it's full of deadly poison, and you walk away going, what more can I say to that? This explains itself. And this is one of these passages in Mark chapter 4. It's one of the rare parables that Jesus gives the parable, and then a short time later, he actually explains the parable. So you, you say this is a complete package. Jesus gave the explanation. But then in verses 10 and 11 and 12, Jesus says these strange things about how people won't get them, and it'll be seeing but not believing and understanding, and they'll hear and they won't get it. And so that's job security for a preacher because it gives us something to talk about. So thank you, Jesus, and here we go, talking about parables. So we'll talk about parables this morning and how and why Jesus taught in parables, but always keeping our eye on the end result which is what it is that he's trying to point us towards, and that's the kingdom of God. Now to back up a little bit, so far in our study of Mark, Jesus has announced the coming of the kingdom of God. It's one of the first things he says in the Gospel of Mark, that the kingdom of God is at hand, or the kingdom of God is here, and it is me. But first he shows the kingdom of God before he tells the kingdom of God. He, he, he brings us the kingdom of God by demonstration before proclamation, which is probably a good pattern for all of us to follow as well. As we lead other people into the things of God and how great the greatness of God, and especially not just God a million miles away in heaven or however far away it is, but colliding with the earth, it's probably good for us to introduce Jesus to other people by demonstration and then by proclamation. So Jesus first demonstrates by traveling around and bringing some of the power of God and the kingdom of God into people's lives, right? He heals. He gives life in places and to people where there had not been life before. And he even heals on the Sabbath. Jesus, how could you do that? And he says, well, because you misunderstand the Sabbath. The Sabbath, uh, we, we're not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is made for us. And he drives out demons, and he's doing all these powerful things, demonstration before proclamation. And now in Mark chapter 4, because people are no doubt curious, what is up with you? Where are you from? Where are you getting the power to do all these things? They've already accused him that it's from a power of a demon. Jesus begins now to preach, and he preaches using parables. And we don't find a ton of parables in the book of Mark. We find other parables in other gospels, but not a ton in the book of Mark. He told a parable in chapter 3. He's going to tell some in chapter 4. He's going to tell some later on in chapter 12. But what is a parable, and why does Jesus use parables, and how do we best understand them? Okay, so first, a show of hands. How many of you like reading parables? You find them meaningful when you read them in the Bible. How many of you like parables? And how many of you don't like parables because you find them too confusing and too much work to understand? Yeah. <clears throat> and that kind of accords with what Jesus says in verses 11 and 12, that I, I tell you parables so you'll get it, but kind of so you won't get it. It's just back and forth. And Jesus, what do you really mean by that? Parables can be frustrating because on the one hand, they're all sufficient. They're the words of God, and they're frustratingly insufficient at times too. So a, par a, a, a parable, a parable, um, the word comes, has that little uh, prefix on it, para, and para means to come alongside of. So if you think of a paraprofessional in a school, maybe some of us work as paraprofessionals, a paraprofessional comes alongside of a child and works closely alongside to help them. A parallel line is a line that comes alongside of another line and sits right alongside. And so a parable functions in the same way that it is a familiar story, one that everybody can relate to, and it comes alongside an unfamiliar story or situation or concept, and we go, oh, I get it. Now, I don't get it entirely. I don't get it exhaustively, but it opens my eyes to say that thing, that weird thing that you're talking about that I don't understand is kind of like this thing. Oh, and I kind of get it. You know who uses parables? Kevin O'Leary on Shark Tank, Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> You've seen that guy, right? 
pompous and arrogant. He's not going to give anybody his money. But, but one time I heard him on Shark Tank, and there were two guys, two dudes pitching their business idea and product. And he says to them, guys, 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 have you ever heard of a Viking funeral? And they said, no. He said, in a Viking funeral, they would load the ship up with wood, and they would pile the dead bodies on top. They would light it on fire, and they would set it out to sea. You're on that ship. <laughs> okay, what has he done? He's just used a parable. He's used a story. He's explained it. Kind of, oh, okay, a Viking funeral. And then, and then the takeaway or the, the kicker line, you're on that ship. And what's he saying to them? He's saying, get lost. I'm not giving you any money for this idea. This is a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> If you ask me, how was your week? Mark, how was your week this week? And I say, well, okay, it's like this. You know when you go to the car repair shop to bring your car in to get one thing done, and it ends up being eight things done, and you walk away spending $1,500? That was my week this week. <laughs> okay. Now, have I told you about my week? Yeah, I mean, kind of. Right? We all know the feeling of going to the car repair shop and spend, intending to spend $45, and we spend $1,500, and we go, oh, oh, I think what he's saying is like he thought this week was going to be about one thing and it ended up being about 10 things, which was the week. Now, I didn't explain every single detail of that to you. I didn't explain like, like that I realized October 1st was upon us and my team had promised to open winter camp registration by October 1st, so had to get that together. I didn't explain that my kid uh, had walking pneumonia early last week and we had to get him on like an inhaler thing for a couple days. I didn't explain that. I didn't explain that um, we're doing What's the Story, this fantastic class for fourth, fifth, and sixth graders and their parents, which in six weeks teaches you the whole story of the Bible from beginning to end and launches on Monday night at 6.30 p.m., shameless plug. I didn't explain that for you. <laughs> So I didn't tell you each and every detail, but I gave you a sense of the emotional punch of my week. My week, which I wanted to be simple and focused, became all these other things. And that's how a parable functions. A parable is not an allegory. In an allegory, each and every little part of the story and each and every little character and detail, the oil change stands for this, and you need a new brake pads, and that stands for this in my life. And that's not what a parable is trying to do. In a parable, we just say, what's the action here? What's the main thing that happened? Or what's the emotion involved here? And then how does it come alongside of this unfamiliar situation, in Jesus' case, the kingdom of God, to give us a little bit of insight into the kingdom of God? But don't overdo it with your interpretation. When you read a parable, don't drive yourself crazy saying, now, well, now who's that character? And, then, and what does this thing mean? Because parables aren't meant to function like that. We can just back up and go in the big picture, what's the story that this parable is telling, and how does it help us understand the kingdom of God? With all of that said, though, the parable of the soils or the parable of the soy sower does kind of function like an allegory, because there's a whole lot of things, a whole lot of details in there. Here's where this uh, seed falls, and here's where this seed falls, and then it comes up, and this is why it doesn't live, and it's choked out. And so that one does kind of function like an allegory, and Jesus does actually explain it. So... Uh, he, he, he says, you know, the farmer goes out and he's scattering the seed. I'm in verse four and it falls along the path and the birds come and eat it up. That's gone. Some falls on rocky places, no soil really to uh, grow into. It springs up quickly, but then the soil is shallow and the sun comes out and the plants are scorched and they withered because they had no root. Others falls in the thorns. That grows up, gets choked out by the plants so it didn't bear grain. And some falls on good soil. And that came up and grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, 60, some 100 times. And then the explanation starts in verse 13. Jesus says to the disciples when they're alone, don't you understand? If you don't understand this, how will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word, and some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown, and as soon as they hear it, Satan comes, takes away the word that was sown in them. Others are like seeds sown on rocky places. They hear the word, and at once they receive it with joy, but since they don't have any root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth and desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. 
And others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word and accept it and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, and some 100 times what was sown. And we can all see ourselves in that parable. At points, different points in our life, we've been those different soils, haven't we? And even to now today, sitting here today, we can see which soil we are. But again, it doesn't explain everything. The sower sows the word. Who's, who's the sower? Was it John the Baptist? Was it a prophet who came before? Is it Jesus himself? Is it God in heaven? Because Jesus isn't on the earth now, so who, is it the Holy Bible? We don't know. But we don't have to overdo the interpretation. We just say, in general, this parable is answering the question for them. Why are some people going to hear the message proclaimed about the kingdom of God, and they're going to turn from it, and others are going to embrace it? Jesus is telegraphing for the disciples, because this is, this is, most parables he starts by saying, the kingdom of God is like this, and then he tells the parable. This one, he doesn't do that. This is the beginning. It says he gets in the boat, he stands back from the shore away because there's so many people there to crowd, and he says, listen, listen. It's almost an arresting way of speaking. Listen, check this out. And he tells a parable that's not really about the kingdom of God, it's about them. And he's telegraphing to his disciples. Everything that you've been following me for, everything that I've been pointing to, everything that you believe, I'm going to share it with all these people, and many of them are not going to believe. They're not going to get it. It even goes so far as to begin to hint, why is Jesus killed? Right? If the kingdom of God and the coming of Jesus is good news, why will people then turn on him? And the answer is right here, because they're bad soil. They're bad soil. So this parable answered that question. For us, it answers the question today. Why can two people be exposed to the word of God, exposed to the same like, set of truths, and some people mature, and other people fall away. That's, it's as simple as that. That's what the parable explains. Except for that tricky little part in verses 10, 11, and 12. So let's look at that here. When he was alone, the 12 and the others around him asked him about the parables. And Jesus told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Is Jesus being difficult? It sounds like it. It sounds like Jesus is withholding good truth from some people and giving it to other people. And we've got to ask why. We've got to grasp this. So in order to grasp this, Let's go back and check the sequence of the events in chapter 4. We'll put this up on screen behind. Okay, number 1, in verses 1 through 9, he's in the boat. He's away from shore, and he tells the parable of the sower. But then the text telegraphs us sometime later. So it's jumping out of sequence now. He's alone with his disciples, and he does verses 10 through 12, and he does the explanation of the parable just for them, 13 through 20. Then in 21 through 30, he talks about not having a, a light and hiding it because the light is meant to, to light the whole house. And so you wouldn't put it in a place that it's concealed. You would put it up high on a stand where it's going to do its work. That seems to be for the disciples as well. Verses 24 and 25, I'm going to come back to these. I'm guessing, I don't know, I'm guessing that this is back for everybody else, but it could just be the disciples. And then 26, the parable of the scattered seed, and verse 30, the parable of the mustard seed, definitely seem like he's back speaking to the crowd. So, so whether Mark just deliberately takes those out of order so that we get the explanation of the sower right after the parable of the sower, we don't know. Or he told the parable of the mustard seed at a later time, and Mark just includes it there. We don't know. But the key is verses 33, and 34, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they can understand. He did not say anything to them, meaning the crowds, without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. So what's going on here? What's going on that Jesus would speak sort of mysteriously and opaquely to the crowd, but when he was only with his disciples, he would explain everything? Here's some possible explanations. Number one, Jesus is being deliberately confusing. He's just messing with the crowd. I guess that's a possible explanation, isn't it? But not plausible. 
Number two, could it be that Jesus actually loves the disciples more than others? So he's blessed them, and, and he just wants to bless them more, and the other people, he just doesn't care. Possible? Not plausible. Is it possible that on the basis of, he, he quotes the Old Testament, Isaiah 6, verse 9 and 10, that Jesus is actually constrained by prophecy or by election, that God said, I'm going to send you to earth, but those people are going to not believe, so you're going to kind of speak mysteriously to them. Those people are going to believe, so you're going to explain everything to them. Is that possible? Well, maybe, but I think there's a fourth, and, and the best explanation is this. The best explanation, I think, is that Jesus, who knew everybody's hearts, understood the importance of belief when it came to receiving truth. There's a connection between your level of belief and how and in what way you will receive and digest truth, spiritual truth. Remember what he said in announcing his ministry in Mark 1, 15. He said, the kingdom of God has come near. And then he said, repent and believe the good news. He didn't, as we so often do in preaching, Explain, 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 detail, illustration, and now I'm going to invite you to believe. He didn't do that. He said, the kingdom of heaven is near. Here I am. Repent and believe the good news, and I'm going to show you what it's all about. Belief before explanation and understanding, you see? Later on in Mark 9, we'll get to this uh, uh, several weeks down the road, there's a demon-possessed boy, and a man comes to Jesus, and he says, Jesus, if you can... Heal my boy, cast this demon out of him. And Jesus says, if you can, he says, he says, man, everything is possible for someone who believes. If we move to other gospels, the word believe occurs in the book of John over 100 times. Let me give you some examples. We don't have these on screen. Just listen. John 1.11, John says, Jesus came to his own people, but they didn't receive him as Messiah, but to all who believed in his name. He gave the right to become children of God. In John 2, he changes the water into wine. And then John says this is the first of his signs that he performed. And his disciples believed in him. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. And of course, the end of the Gospel of John, there's Thomas, doubting Thomas. I won't believe it until I can see the nail holes with my own eyes. And Jesus shows him and he says, now Thomas, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas says, I do believe. And Jesus says, it's because you've seen me that you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Something gets unlocked in you, doesn't it? The moment that you believe and you hear truth differently, you receive truth differently, you live truth differently because you've got belief inside of you. That's why I personally believe that verses 24 and 25 are meant for the crowd. Listen to them again. Jesus says, consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. I think this is a prophetic statement by Jesus to the crowd. He says, if you come to me with an em empty thimble of belief, wanting to be filled, that's all you're going to get. But you come to me with a bushel basket or a giant a pod storage container waiting to be filled with belief, I'm going to fill it up and then some. Yeah. And so the question for us this morning is, how big is your measure? How much are you willing to believe? Because Jesus will give according to the measure of our belief. And then beyond the Gospels, Hebrews 11:6, without faith it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. What a striking statement. Anyone who comes to you, you can't even come to God unless you have an inkling of belief in you that he actually exists. But that makes sense, right? Who prays to God without a, a little bit of belief that God is there listening and hearing on the other side? 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, 
The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Then the reverse of that is also true, isn't it? The moment somebody becomes a believer, they can see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who's the image of God. I've been meeting lately with a young guy who grew up at this church. He's now in college, and, and he, he asked me, can we meet periodically? I've just got some questions about the Christian faith that I was raised in, and I'm not sure I believe all of it, but I'd, I'd like to talk about it. And so we've been having these conversations about uh, election and free will and, and all these things, and I'm happy to answer his questions, but at some point I'm going to need to say to him, hey, dude, you need to believe You need to believe, because I can explain this stuff until I die, but if your heart is unbelieving, you're going to receive it or reject it in a certain way, and if your heart is open and believing, you're going to hear the answers that I give you in a totally different way. In the surge ministry, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, whenever I map out to teach to kids, I always differentiate between what, what I want them to know and what I want them to believe. Things I want them to know, I can, I can nail that airtight. I can give illustrations, explanations, word pictures, object lessons, and they will walk out knowing these five things. I cannot engineer what they end up believing. Parents, I want to take the pressure off you this morning, and I want you to repeat this after me. I cannot engineer my child's beliefs. Say that. I cannot engineer my child's beliefs. We can set the table for them. We can influence them. We can try to do all the right things. But in the end, belief is an expression of the will. And man, from the time they're little, do they have a will. (laughs) And you can try and shape it, and you can try and influence it, and you can wish for the best. But you cannot engineer what they believe. So how's your belief? And what is holding you back from believing even more? And see, that's the difference between the crowds and the disciples. The disciples already believed. How did Jesus know they believed? Because they'd given up their lives, their careers, their ambitions, and they followed him. And Jesus said, you believe. So I'm going to reveal more of myself to you. I'm going to reveal more of the kingdom of God. Those people, they think that I can give them explanation and illustration and instruction, but they don't believe. Some of them will believe. But the ones who don't believe, it doesn't matter how much instruction or explanation I give them. They're not going to get it. That's what Jesus is telegraphing to his disciples by telling the parable of the sower. We don't understand our way into the kingdom of God. We believe it. St. Augustine uh, lived in the like 300s, 400s. Uh, he was from North Africa, and he became a bishop. But, but he had a phrase and translated into Latin. It was, I don't speak Latin, but fides quorens intellectum, which meant faith, seeking, understanding. So you believe first, and then you ask the questions and seek to understand what is it that I've really put my faith in here. It's not blind faith. It's not stupid faith. That's not what we're arguing for. We're just saying that there's a component of belief that has to come at the beginning of your journey, and then God will open your eyes to things that were just so blurry and so confusing before. So, in summary, Jesus is not being difficult. Jesus is not being clever or cagey. That's probably why he starts with the parable of the soils. To say, okay, You've been following me because of my magic, and you want to know more about me? Then you think that I'm going to explain it all to you, and I could, but until you believe, I can only take you so far. It could be that Jesus is hinting at, there's a word, and it is ineffable. When something is ineffable, it is so big, so wonderful, so complex that you cannot box it in and you cannot put it into words. Words cannot fully express it. And that's true of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God ultimately is ineffable. So Jesus tells a number of parables about it in Mark, but in other gospels as well. But ultimately, words are going to fail the enormity and the immensity and the amazingness of the kingdom of God. 
So, now you want me to explain to you the parable of the scattered seed and the parable of the mustard seed. And I'm not going to, because Jesus doesn't. So here, this is it. If this was good enough instruction for the people from Jesus, it's going to be good enough for you. But what I'm going to encourage you to do is take those two parables and sit with them this week and spend time with them. And I'm going to give you a a few pointers right now on how to read and study parables, how to approach parables. Okay, number one, parables are meant to make you think. And because we didn't live in the day that they lived in, and we're in a different cultural context, we got to think sometimes really hard to break through. Remember, you're you're taking a familiar story or situation alongside an unfamiliar one, and you're going, oh, okay, I see the point of connection there. But for us, there may be no point of connection at all, because it's just like a totally different society. So parables are meant to make you think. So spend some time with them. The parable of the mustard seed, I never fully appreciated. It's only two verses long. Okay, it's a mustard seed. It's a tree. It grows really big and birds learn it. Yeah, whatever. But my goodness, when you slow down, there's a deep, deep meaning in that parable. So don't gloss over it based on the number of verses. Take your time with it. Parables are made to, to make you think. Now, I like how there's a spiritual practice you can do with kids called godly play. And in godly play, when you tell all different types of stories, but one of the types of stories that you tell is parables, when you tell a parable, you bring your materials in a gold box, and you introduce each parable in a way like this. You say, well, I wonder what this could be. It's gold. Usually things that are gold are really, really valuable. I wonder if it could be a parable. Parables are really, really valuable. It almost looks like a present. And parables are like presents that were given to you even before you were born. You didn't do anything to earn them. They were just given to you. It has a lid on it. Sometimes things with lids on it are really hard to open and get into. But that's okay. If you just keep coming back to it, eventually the parable will open up to you. And then you tell kids the parable. I like that. Yeah. So parables are meant to make you think. Number two, parables are cultural. They're cultural. So I would never, uh, in front of the kids who I teach, I would never tell the car repair story because they can't relate. They can't relate to bringing your car in for one thing and you need 10 things done. So that parable doesn't work with them. And the same thing with us. When we read the parables of Jesus, sometimes it doesn't work for us because we didn't live in that culture. So Google it, right? Find out what exactly was he talking about. That's how it's going to relate. That's how you're going to make the connection. Number three, parables are visual. So read it and then close your eyes and try to see the picture that he's constructing. Number four, parables are largely agricultural. It's unfortunate for most of us who don't farm for a living, except that there is something of a mystery and a miracle in growth. Isn't it? If you saw my, my weekly huddle thing on Thursday, and I was talking about the flower bed where my kids and I have tried to plant seeds, and oh my goodness, then of course a day later, somebody gives my kids sunflower seeds. So he is just desperate to plant these sunflower seeds that I know are not going to work in that flower bed, but we're going to give it a shot. But when, when you do plant anything, you plant a tree or a flower or, or anything, and it takes off, there's like this moment of appreciation in you, isn't there? Where you go, oh. I didn't have to do anything. I mean, I did, but I didn't really do the work. It just took off. And that's why Jesus uses agricultural parables, because there's our work and there's God's work, and and you can't control God's work. God just does the work. And fifthly, parables are mostly aimed at illuminating and helping us understand this thing called the kingdom of God. So that's the point of every parable. Especially if he begins by saying the kingdom of God is like or the kingdom of heaven is like. It's helping us understand the kingdom of God. So, so I want to spend a few minutes at the close here talking about the nature of the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is first and foremost a spiritual reality. It's not not real just because we can't see it, just because we can't put our hands on it. It's a real thing, but it's a spiritual reality. It's what happens when God who is in heaven, brings his will to earth. And he sees his 
his, his, his wishes uh, realized and his values realized and implemented among people and the earthly systems and highways and byways that we travel. And that's the kingdom of God. Jesus told his disciples to pray for that in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done. That is a prayer for the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven to be realized here on earth. When Jesus brings the kingdom of God, remember he first does it through demonstration before proclamation. So it's not just theory. It's not just philosophy. And it's not just what happens when we someday die and go to heaven. It's the power of God in the here and now. Now, what happens is Jesus begins demonstrating the kingdom of God on earth. Demons released from people. A man who can't walk lowered through the ceiling and he's able to get up and take his mat and walk away. And people go, oh, I want that. Oh, a magic man. I want this. He could do good things for me. And they begin to follow them. And then when Jesus begins to preach, he says, now hang on. Don't get hooked on the magic of God. I want to hook you on the kingdom of God. And the magic of God is part of the kingdom of God. All the power and stuff is there, but it doesn't stop at the magic of God. If our faith is in the magic of God, then Jesus just came as a genie. The kingdom of God is here, and it's me. What can I do for you? Make your wish list. I am here to help your every dream come through. And nowhere in the gospel does Jesus say that, of course. Jesus instead reorients our values and our priorities. And he says, this power of mine, it is wrapped up in a bigger reality called the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a parallel reality when you're a believer. It really is. Yeah, I really said that. Like, like think sci-fi. It's a second place, and you're inhabiting the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the earth at the same time. And Jesus says, this is available to you. If our faith is in the kingdom of God, then, then we believe in Jesus as a king. And Jesus gets to operate as a king. And what does a king do? A king surveys the whole realm over which he has authority. And, and he decides this needs to be fixed. This isn't running right. We're going to dispatch servants, soldiers, builders, workers, whatever, and we're going to build up the kingdom. And that's what Jesus has been trying to do since he left the earth. Building up the kingdom, per, believer by believer, person by person, institution by institution. Jesus is building the kingdom of God, sometimes in unseen and really surprising ways. But the work continues. And it takes time. It takes time. The magic of God is instantaneous. You place your belief in Jesus for salvation, your eternal life is sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, and that happens in an instant. But the work of the kingdom of God proceeds very deliberately and very slowly and sometimes even imperceptibly. We can't tell that it's happening. If you were going to create a kingdom, let's just think about that for a second. If you were going to create a kingdom... How would you do it? And the answer is, I already have. You already have. It's called the kingdom of self. And when, if we're not attentive to that, the kingdom of self takes over and the kingdom of God takes a back seat or even goes on the shelf. Oh, yeah, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I got this to do. But in the kingdom of God, Jesus gets to call the shots. The kingdom of self is all about me. The kingdom of God is all about us. And, and I am part of us, but I'm not the center of the kingdom of God. Does the concept of importance exist in the kingdom of God? Yeah, yeah. Jesus teaches about that at the end of Mark 10, verse 45. Does money exist in the kingdom of God and stewardship of resources? Yeah. Yeah, Jesus tells the parable of the talents. Is there mercy on sinners who repent and not just unending, unrelenting judgment? Yeah, Jesus told some parables about that. Does the concept of mercy for others exist in the kingdom of God? Yeah, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. On and on and on. And so as Jesus teaches, as he proclaims 
the bringing of the kingdom, he is reorienting our values and our perspective, hinting at something better. This is not all there is. We can do better. So he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Because just me wanting the best for me, but forget everybody else, that's an earthly concern. But wholeness for all God's creation, that's a kingdom concern. Jesus says new wine needs new wineskins because tradition for tradition's sake is an earthly concern. It's a power play. But making room for the supremacy of Christ in all things, even that, that means that my will has to yield a little bit, that's a kingdom concern. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, Jesus says in chapter 3, because self-importance and self-righteousness, that's an earthly concern, but humility and brokenness, that's a kingdom concern. The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, Sin, because sin is a kingdom concern. Mistakes, that's an earthly concern, but sin is a kingdom concern. Valuing the fruit of the Spirit. Everybody wants that, believer, non-believer. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Everybody wants that. But inviting the Spirit's presence and cultivating its work in my life, also known as spiritual growth, so that the plant or the tree, which is you, has fertile ground to grow and the fruit emerges as an overflow, that's a kingdom concern. Calling our young people to sacrificial discipleship, that's a kingdom concern. The power of God is great, but the kingdom of God is greater. And Jesus says, desire this greater thing. Buy into the new thing that I'm doing. Well, recently, I went through a period where I felt like I was fighting lots of battles alone. Alone. Maybe you felt that way before. Where you just feel there's so much going on, people want so much from you, and you just feel like you're fighting every battle alone. Have you ever felt like that? Okay. So I went to Monday prayer which they have in the chapel from like noon to three. And Jeff prayed for me. And without me telling him what was going on, he said to me, you've got troubles. And I just kind of nodded with my eyes closed. And he said, but God is with you in the troubles. I'd forgotten that. I'd forgotten that. Sometimes we can treat like God and our God life as like this corner of life, this really important corner of life, and maybe we go every single day and we never miss a quiet time. So we're getting fueled up by God, but then we go out into the great wide world and we fight all these battles ourselves. And this reminder, you've got troubles, but God is with you in the troubles, was a good reminder for me. That even when I would lay down my head and sleep at night, God was continuing to work on my troubles and continuing to work in me and through me and before me. Now, a couple weeks ago, we were treated to Ryan's hand-drawn work here, which we'll put up on screen. Okay. And then I drew one of my own. Now, snaps. Back one slide. Ryan's. Go back one slide. <laughs> Snap for Ryan. Okay. Snap for me. Next one. <laughs> Whatever. All right. But I felt like this was me. This was me uh, just down on ground level. The rain's pouring down on me, and I'm in the, the thick of it, the weeds, the that's a dollar sign, and that's a, a dumbbell barbell representing like weight that's got to be moved. And then now you can go to the next slide. And when Jeff prayed that for me, <laughs> this is the parallel existence thing that Jesus points to, that we are lifted up above our troubles. We're still in the world, and we're still having to solve those troubles, but it gives us a perspective from up high what really needs to be done right now? And what can wait? What, when you're down on the ground, seems like it's just creeping up over your head, but from a distance, it's not that big a deal. Not that big a deal. Right? 
And that's what Jesus invites us into in the kingdom of God. And membership is open to everyone. It's open to everyone. The admission fee has been paid, but it's not free. It's not free. Because it's like this. It's like if someone came up to you today and said, hey, I've got an all expenses paid vacation for you in Hawaii, leaving tomorrow. Have to leave tomorrow. No, I got, but I, I got an important work meeting this week. No, if you want this, you, you got to put your agenda aside and you got to take me up on the offer right now. And that's the offer of the membership in the kingdom of God. Now, again, not that Jesus is going to deliver us from, from all hardship and trouble. It is not, we're not just dying and going to heaven. We're still living our earthly lives in the here and now. But we've got to be able to take our hands off the wheel and go, okay, 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 all right, going forward, you can put me in the bucket truck and lift me up, Jesus, and then you can direct my values and my priorities, what needs to be done today, what needs to be done next week, and what doesn't need to be done at all. And that's why it's, the admission fee is paid, but it's not free. It's going to cost us something. Believing is a form of dying. Do you know that? Jesus says in John, unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it can't sprout and become other things. Believing in him is a form of dying. So when we believe in him, we have to surrender this hardened cynicism. We have to surrender the materialism. We have to surrender naturalism and embrace supernaturalism. But Jesus calls us to die because he calls us to believe. Are you willing to believe? Are you willing to die today and gain access to the kingdom of God? One expression of our belief that we can exist this way in the world, but spiritually connected to our creator and to God incarnate, which was his son, Jesus Christ. One expression of that is to take communion because in communion, we take the elements, which you were handed as you walked in the door today, and if you weren't, just put a hand up and someone will come around and distribute more elements. And let me show you how this works. At the top, there's a little tab you can pull off, and your wafer is under the clear tab. So there's a clear tab, and then there's a purple tab underneath. You'll take those out and separate those. Here's the wafer in the top, and then beneath it is the juice. So communion, it's a tangible reminder of an intangible thing. Jesus says the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is in our midst. Where? Can I touch it? Well, not really. You've got to believe. But this is a tangible reminder. It's a reminder of the time when Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples the night before he went to the cross. And he said, now, as we break this bread and take this bread, I want you to think about, always think about, always remember my body, which is broken for you. Whenever you take the bread, do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread in remembrance of Jesus. And then Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you receive this cup, take it in remembrance of me. So now let's pray and we're going to sing one chorus and then uh, I'll wrap up with a little challenge for you, okay? Jesus, thank you that the immensity of who you are um, was not just limited to your time on earth. 
It was not limited to your miracles. It was not limited to your teachings. And people who try to classify you as just one thing miss the point of what you brought. You brought the kingdom of God, which is an eternal, intangible reality. We can't see it. We can't capture it fully in words. And yet, it is so, so real that we don't want to miss it. And admittance comes when we pay the price of believing. If we have not done that, we want to give you our whole hearts and open our hearts to you and say, I want to believe. I want to believe, God. I want to come to you with a big measure. Pour yourself out to me. And you will not let us down on that prayer. As we sing to you now and as we go about our week, Lord, remind us of the importance of our belief in you and coming to you on the basis of belief. Not reason, reason's important. Not proof texts, proof texts are helpful. But like a child, coming to you on the basis of belief. We sing to you now, in Jesus' name, amen. This week, read a parable about the kingdom of God. Might be one of those ones in Mark, if you want to find another one in another gospel, and just ask, what is it expressing to me? How is it opening my eyes about the kingdom of God? Then ask yourself, am I committed to the kingdom of God or just the magic of God? And then ask yourself, what work of the king am I excited about? What work of the king in the kingdom am I excited about? But some of you aren't there. Some of you are just at the point still wrestling with this question, can I really believe? Can I believe? And if that's you, we want to pray for you especially. We want to pray for any needs this morning. As a church, we'll have folks down here at the front of the stage who would love to talk to you and pray with you. But but especially if you're at the point of saying, I just don't know if I can believe. That's why none of this is registering, because I don't believe. The disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. And, And we want to pray that God would increase your faith. God, grow our belief muscles in order that we could truly see and understand, that we could hear and believe you. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.